Good evening. My name is Attorney Daphne Barbie Wooten. I am the daughter of Attorney Lloyd A. Barbie, and who is a state representative, a civil rights activist, and attorney in Wisconsin. He went to University of Wisconsin Madison Law School and practiced in Milwaukee, Wisconsin most of his life. I'm going to read an expert from a book I edited called Justice for All Selected Writings of Lloyd A. Barbie. I'm going to begin with chapter seven, which is women's rights. And here I'm reading from his legislative comments about birth control dated March 8th, 1973. In a recent hearing before the Senate Veterans Affair Committee, State Senator Gordon Roselip presented a speech opposing the liberalization of Wisconsin's birth control laws. This is nothing new. The astounding characteristic of his presentation, however, was the illogic and irony in which he employed in the speech. From the premise that, quote, the sons of the poor were the primary source of manpower for the Vietnam War, unquote. Rose Lip said, quote, now you want to give contraceptives to poor people? Where are we going to get men for the armed forces if we have another conflict? It's a good way to destroy an army." Unquote. During my whole tenure as a legislator, Senator Roselip has been an amiable opponent of mine who inanely spouts criticism concerning my efforts towards eliminating civil injustices and inequities. While some people may be shocked over his comment, it is no surprise to me that the Darlington Republican would make a statement concerning the establishment's use of the poor. If he had his way, Senator Roselip would more aptly employ the poor as a sex machine to produce recruits for the war machine. Yet, if Mr. Roselip thinks that the disenfranchised minorities in our society will continue to be fuel for the war machine, then I advise that he take another look. This should serve as a clear lesson for blacks and have-nots to become involved in ways to change the system through planned political action. Either that or accept Roselip's plan to make the poor people partners in making love for war. Uh, that was one of his comments. I'm going to read you another comment he made, which applies to the present day and it's regarding um, Black Lives Matters and the homicide of African Americans, um, unjustifiable homicide of African Americans. And this is dated August 24, 1973. This past weekend, another black man was killed by policemen in Milwaukee. And as usual, the most articulate witnesses were the police who did the shooting. The victim was a 22 year old Andrew friend. According to reporters, police had seen friend walking in the vicinity of 60th Street and Silver Spring Road. He was supposedly babysitting during this time at a home in West Lawn Public Housing Project. Because the two policemen who were patrolling the area had thought his actions to be rather peculiar, they decided to stop friend for questioning. Friend ran and finally went back to the home where he was babysitting. When the police arrived at the home, he was reportedly holding three of the children hostages with, another, with a butcher knife. Policemen then shot Friend. The medical examiner reported that Friend died instantaneously from two 38 caliber bullets, one wound in his head and one in his back. Despite the stories which appeared in the establishment press and the district attorney's opinion of justifiable homicide, I urge all concerned citizens once again to support a unilateral dis disarmament of law enforcement agencies. As it is now, it seems apparent that we are placing our own lives, limbs, and health in jeopardy by allowing armed police to patrol our streets with weapons and chemicals as war. 
Without weapons of destruction and harm, these officers would not have overreacted to the situation. Instead, they would have found a sane approach using imagination and human psychology to solve the problem encountered. What really comes to my mind in this incident was the use of weapons in such close quarters for the purpose of subduing a person who was presumably risking the lives of small children. Instead of a sure solution for ending the risk, this incident could have easily resulted in the death of the children. It was more luck than anything else that saved these children, especially when the so-called heroics were performed by impulsive, trigger-happy men in blue, whose motto seems to be shoot first, rationalize second, and leave it up to other law enforcement and injudicious officers to temporize homicide last. I urge readers to reconsider an earlier incident occurring on Monday night, June 25, when Milwaukee police answered a call of a black man who was allegedly drunk and causing a fracas at a local gas station. After being arrested for disorderly conduct the district at the district police station, once the doors of the station garage were open, police said, he, or closed, he tried to take a pistol away from an officer and started shooting wildly. Immediately, of course, he was shot and killed. When the confusion had ended, four policemen were found slightly wounded, hospitalized, and released almost immediately. Brother Pettis was entombed forever. Once again, all the witnesses were policemen. A number of Milwaukee Blacks considered this action unjustifiable homicide by the police. The DA's office did not. Nothing came of this charge. How many more killings by this state shall we take? Time and time again, Milwaukee statistics consistently show that police have injured and abused more citizens than the citizens themselves. Murder is bad. It's a bad immoral act, no doubt about it. But most non-governmental murders are usually committed out of the heat of passion and irrationally. Killings committed by police are worse. Since they are supposed to be acting in a wise and rational manner during the performance of their duties, protecting life, liberty, and property. And then I have one last that I'm going to read and it's about the criminal justice system in Wisconsin. Um, <clears throat> It's imprisonment of the poor. Last, it's 19, June 11, 1973. Last week at an assembly judiciary committee hearing, some of my fellow legislators and lawyers were surprised to learn that Wisconsin still allows imprisonment for the poor for the non-payment of debts. This new awareness came when we discussed a bill that I authored repealing the section of the statutes relating to civil arrest of persons for failure to pay debts. A number of blacks and poor people have been placed in jail, not only in Milwaukee, but other counties as well, as a result of dubious debts, where a judgment has been granted in a small claims court against the debtor, many times without a court appearance. The person said to owe the money is given insufficient time to pay off the debt, so the court sentences the debtor to a term in jail. An even more onerous and oppressive provision of the Wisconsin statutes require attorney, court, and collection costs to be added to the debt. Those who are unable to pay back the money within the time allotted through discretion of the court are charged additional monies for food and upkeep while in jail. The whole reasoning behind such discriminatory laws seems lacking. Once the debtor concludes his jail sentence, he or she still owes the money which was awarded to the plaintiff during a small claims trial. In fact, he must pay back even more than when he first thought, when he was first brought to court. In addition, placing a person in jail for non-payment of debt does nothing for speeding up the payment of, to the claimant. It therefore seems that the only rationale for such a law is punishment for the sake of revenge. Revenge is an archaic and insensible attitude that has no legitimate place in our judicial system. The history of the debtor statutes is bleak and grim. 
During the post-Civil War times, such laws were used to keep newly emancipated Blacks in jail, on debt farms, under the authority of the people who they owed. In many situations, Blacks were forced back into slavery so they could work off the money debts alleged by the whites. Today, such statutes still act unfairly on Blacks and other minority groups. The poor and uneducated fall victims to unscrupulous money lenders, high pressure salesmen, and read between the lines type of credit applications. Since the poor usually pay more for the same service and products enjoyed by everyone else, these debtor imprisonment statutes are discriminatory. Our state and federal constitution should prohibit such laws, but until we get them declared unconstitutional, the legislature must repeal these unfair laws. The poor should use their money wisely by not hawking their future earnings before the money is in their hands. In short, you people beware of credit. It will keep and even get you placed in jail. Are there any questions? Hello? Is anybody on? Okay. Um, uh, I see. Well, I'm going to continue on as I have about four more minutes. One, um, this is called uneducable, uneducable legislatures, a press release, September 30th, 1971. Two items concerned with educational me needs have come out of Madison last week. One has to do with uneducable legislatures, the other with education bills. Before we take a look at the state legislators' reactionary reactions, I would like to report on two educational bills which I have authors that have a hearing set before the Assembly Education Committee two weeks ago. One of the bills before that committee would require that Afro-American history and history of the American Indian be taught in our elementary and high schools. There is a need to see that public schools reflect the fact that African achievement predates that of Europe. Presently, only the most enlightened schools treat this subject truthfully, and they tend to be schools of higher educational learning. The other bill before the committee would allow any person 15 years or older to cease attending school if the person can pass a high school equivalency test. It seems to me that those legislators who have been berating the welfare mothers and father grappi uh, protests and in contempt of court by using Father Grappi as a scapegoat. If that wasn't enough, legislatures refused to recognize that they precipitated Monday's march and takeover by making totally unconscionable cuts in the budget and by passing tax increases, which adversely affect the poor. I welcome the welfare demonstrators to the assembly chamber, and it is my belief that the reactionary and cowardly leaders of the assembly had welcomed the demonstrators and requested representatives of the welfare mothers to address a joint session of the legislature, perhaps some of the less informed and more callous members of the legislature might have had their eyes open. This would have displayed not only hospitality, good manners, and a decent approach to justice, but would have averted an escalation of the tempers which caused a temporary delay in commencing the special section session called to permit the legislators to drop a pebble on the beach of humanity while dropping boulders on themselves. And now, since it's almost 15 minutes time that I have, and if anybody has a question, uh, feel free. I don't see any comments. Okay, thank you. Appreciate it. Save it. 